For those lucky few in the world who have a million pounds plus to drop on an exquisitely crafted, incredibly quick track toy, there are a few options available from McLaren, Aston Martin, Ferrari, but there's another name to add to that list. This is the Brabham BT62, and today we're gonna to take a closer look. With a naturally aspirated 5.4 liter V8, mid-mounted and delivering just shy of 700 horsepower and 492 pounds-feet of torque, the BT62 should be an absolute thrill to drive for the customers who will start to take delivery of the limited run of 70 cars early next year. What's possibly equally thrilling though is the return of the Brabham name to the automotive world. Named after the legendary F1 driver Jack Brabham and run by his son David Brabham, a veteran of motorsport in his own right, this could be the return of a historic name to the car industry. And who better to talk us through the car than the man himself? David, it is an absolutely beautiful car. For starters, it's quite clearly, and everyone agrees on that wholeheartedly, but it's functional. This, this, is, this design can develop up to 1,200 kilograms of downforce, is that right? Yeah. Can you talk me through from, from the front to the back how the car does that? What, what tool does it have at its disposal to achieve that? You know, aerodynamics are one of the, the biggest key factors in any race car. And uh, it's all about efficiency and, and getting that, that 1,200 kilos of downforce uh, in, a, in an efficient way, which is, which is also drivable at the same time. So obviously when, the, when we kind of put all this package together, we have to think about, you know, when the, when the air hits the front of the car, where the way it flows through and goes all the way to the back, like, like any, any particular race car. Obviously, we've got to cool it, so we've got the radiators, we've got the, the, the ducts that come out the, for the hot air. The, water, the air comes in there, hot air comes out and flows over the top of the vehicle. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a huge hole. That's kind of anticipating a massive volume of air coming through there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, cool, cooling a, a 5.4 litre, 700 horsepower engine is, uh, is, is pretty important. It also um, accounts for weight distribution in the vehicle as well, because mm -hmm. obviously that full of water is going to be a fair old bit of weight in the front of the car. Yeah. What's the weight distribution ended up at front to rear? Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty close to 50-50. Yeah. You know, again, going back to the kind of aerodynamics, every, every, every sort of bit of <laughs> surface where, and gaps where uh, the air goes through, there has to be a purpose yeah. to it, obviously, in terms of uh, cooling, uh, as well as aer aerodynamic efficiency and downforce and, and, and drag. So um, you can see over here, we've got, as you would see in, in most race cars, you've got the exits here uh, to let the air come out. Yeah. And that, uh, that helps both with downforce and um, uh, efficiency. Where did that come from that we really want this to have this much downforce as a car? Uh, to be honest, when we did the when we did the sort of brief of the vehicle, we wanted it to make it um, a kind of unrestricted GT car, and uh, you know, obviously, it gave us some freedom because this isn't uh, restricted by any racing regulations as such. So, it gave us the ability to be able to shape the car um, from from an aerodynamic point of view to make sure that we've got you know we've got the floor underneath, we've got the diffuser at the back, we've got the channels of air coming through here um, and, the, and as you can see the, we've got the air intake here, we've got air coming out of here for, for cooling. Um, all these things have an effect on the rear wing and on the rear diffuser as well so yeah. you know it's spent quite a lot of time in CFD trying to get uh, the efficiency right as well as um, you know, the designer looking at the shape of the car and, and that fight between, oh, this will be better for performance here, but it's not gonna look good. So let's, you know, let's find that medium happy ground. And I think we achieved that with the car. I mean, the, clearly the amount of downforce it can generate is more than enough for what it could possibly need out on track. I guess you wouldn't want oh, much more. You can never more. have enough. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, but surely too much downforce is going to impede it in, in, on, on the straight. And, and, and well, yeah, from, say from a racing driver point of view, you're always looking for as much downforce as possible. Yeah. But um, obviously for the BT62, we, you, know, you can go mad and have the car look very strange, but have a lot more downforce. You know? So that's why I said it's all like that balance between function and form. We wanted the car to look good, but we needed to perform on track. And, mm. um, and a lot of the performance actually comes from the weight of the car. So being so light, you know, dry weight is 972 kilos, um, even with everything 
in it is still under a thousand. So um, it, it, the fact that it's that light with that kind of downforce and, and 700 horsepower at the back makes it a fast car. Mm. And the aero, it, it's not adaptive aero, it's all, it's fixed, obviously it can be dialed in and set up for your track day as you want, but it's... Yeah, there's no, there's no active aerodynamics on it. Um, it is as, as a race car would be. Um, we obviously can make adjustments to the rear flap and, and the angle of the main plane. Yeah. So we've got plenty of adjustability in the rear wing. Um, and obviously ride heights play a very key role um, in terms of the way the, the car balances as, as well. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty sizable rear wing on the back. It's, it's not small. Yeah, it's, it's the not full small. width of the car. Yeah, and, absolutely, yeah. And so that's, that's obviously a, a big key element to, to getting the aerodynamic downforce that we, we wanted to try and achieve. And of course, it's got quite a big rear diffuser coming out the back as well. So all of, all of that plays together. Um, and you know, the, the, the height of this, this rear wing as well, compared to you know, some cars that mm. have it are much higher. We wanted to make it look, look right as well as functionality in terms of aerodynamics. But as soon as we get closer here, it sucks more out of the, the rear wing, uh, out of the rear diffuser. So it, it makes it quite efficient. Looks are incredibly attractive, very contemporary, but the engine is a naturally aspirated V8, very traditional. Um, some might say even old school form of propulsion. Not only is it no, not hybridized or in any shape or form, it's no turbocharging or of any sort. Why was this decision made to go with a V8? It can't simply be for how it sounds, which, which <laughs> we, can, we can all guess. Yeah, well, well, hopefully it does here sound in a pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, hopefully no, we'll does, turn it over yeah. in a minute and, and see what that actually sounds like. But sound alone, it can't be the only reason. So what else was behind the decision making in a naturally aspirated V8? Well, I mean, it, we, we just talked about a little bit earlier about weight as well. Um, you know, you put all the hybrid stuff in, it starts to crank up the weight of the vehicle. Um, and this, this, is, this is a raw race car. Um, it sounds fantastic. The weight distribution works well with it. So you start putting all those other sort of hybrid elements at the, at this, in this type of vehicle, it, it changes it completely. Um, and we didn't want that. We just felt it was much better to, to have the V8. It sounds great. You just inside, you feel the vibration of it. It's having that sense of driving and driving something pretty special and raw underneath you. Mm -hmm. And you are one of the only people who's actually gone out and driven uh, driven this in anger. So, but also as an experienced driver, how does this compare to other cars? Uh, it was it was very much about what, what I wanted to get in and drive, and because having driven so many types of different vehicles, the sort of the GT one era that I drove back in uh, sort of mid two thousands with Aston Martin with the mm -hmm. DB nine, and I and then you jump into like a, a prototype a P two or a P one, it's it's somewhere in between. It's that right. kind of that kind of range of performance and feel. Was there a moment when you first got to drive it in anger yourself where you thought, yeah, we've got a winner, a particular point on track, it doing something that you thought, yeah, this is it? You know, it, it, a strange thing about drivers, you can get in a vehicle and you can do one lap and you just know mm -hmm. whether this car has got the basics of a very good car. And, and I felt that straight away. So I thought, great, because it would have worried me if we hadn't because there was always a lot of work to do. But Which is a good thing, not just because you're involved in the business, but your name's on the back of the car as well. What's that like, having the Brabham name? You know, your dad's name, your name, your son's name. We've got three generations active in motorsport. It's cool. <laughs> it, it's strange at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, I think I've said this a lot to, to the people in, in our group, so I don't think we quite realise the significance of this moment right now, because, you know, fast forward 5, 10, 15 years' time, we look back, we'll go, wow, that was something special. But at the moment, you know, we're, we're working flat out on the programme. It's so difficult to pull back and go, wow, isn't this really cool? Because there's so much work to be done. Um, you know, we're up and running, we're, we're pushing things along. And it kind yeah. of begs the question, what are the next steps? Because the shape and a lot of the engineering, it feels like it can be adapted for the road, it can be adapted for FIA regulations. Is that very much on the, on the radar? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously this particular vehicle, you know, the architecture and the, and the theory behind it is going to help us go into different directions, which so potentially down the road car route and obviously through the racing route. So, you know, like I said, the architecture of the way it's being built can be split into those different areas with the next variant. And um, that's the exciting thing, to see Brabham back on a racetrack 
Our goal was to go to Le Mans. Um, my dad won the Formula One World Championship in a car of his own construction. I'd love to go to Le Mans as a driver in a Brabham and win at Le Mans with a Brabham car, which I think, don't think many people have done that either. No, so no, um, that would be pretty cool. I guess the next thing will be for, well, for lucky a few people to get their hands on it, but hopefully to get a drive. And we'll be badgering, badgering you and the rest of the company to see if we can get our hands behind the wheel. But that, that, is, that is happening right now, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is happening right now. Yeah. I think for now, if we could turn over the engine and just get a, to hear it in place, I think that would whet the appetite for now. Yeah? We should give it a crack, shouldn't we? And this is what the view will be like for those 70 people who are lucky enough to be able to buy this thing. It's right on the border between all out race car. This steering wheel in front of me looks like it's straight out of a Formula One car with the, the low dash and the small aperture of the window and the, the exposed chassis here and the, and the carbon of the skin wrapped around it. But just enough nice touches, Alcantara and quality finishes and everything to give it more of that luxury road car feel. It sits right on the, the cusp of those two. And these seats are an entity in their own right. They're not just hugging, keeping you in. They're like a cocoon in the room, right? If I lean back, you can't even see me. With a helmet on, there must only be barely enough room to have your head move slightly from left to right. This already feels like the car it's meant to be. This isn't going to be bought and driven slowly down Knightsbridge or parked outside Harrods. This is a track car to be driven fast on track. There'll only be a lucky few in the world who'll get to own one and probably even less so from the press who get to drive one. We can but hope that we'll be on our list. But for now, getting to sit in one right now, is pretty special. Can't wait to see one in action. Don't forget to subscribe. By being subscribed, you will never miss out on all the films that we do and hit that bell icon to make sure that you get notified when we do something new. Uh, follow us on Instagram at Films or on Twitter at Carfection and find our Facebook page. See you next time.